All right, so um, I think this is a good time to get started. So hold on one second. So in case anyone missed it, um, you can also follow along on the book down as well as the video is gonna be posted after this meeting. So I'll start off. So I wanna say, um, hi everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm so glad that you're all coming here for to continue with the R4DS book club for cohort nine. Today, we'll be going into chapter six, where we'll be talking about data tidying. So let me share my screen. So let's go here. All right, so we're gonna go to data tidying and just to give an overview. So here are a couple of things that we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna talk about how to classify data sets as tidy or non-tidy. We also talk about pivoting data to make it more tidy, separate and unite columns to make them more tidy, deal with missing values in a data set, combine functions to tidy a data set, as well as recognize reasons that non-tidy data might be preferred in some cases. So to start off, I wanna give a basic introduction. So in previous chapters, we talked a lot about how to write good code and how to work with the data. And some of these things include certain conventions that you might want to follow when it comes to making variables or just some basics in how to say create scatter plots or even transform the data to make it work in the way you like it to. And so that's something that we've covered in previous chapters. In this chapter, we'll talk a little bit more about that and more specifically go into tidy data, which is this way of thinking about how you organize and work with your data using the tidyverse packages that we've been using throughout this whole book. And tidy data is just this way we like to have data structured so that way it's easier to work with, especially when it comes to the tidyverse package. And we will see this idea of tidy data when it comes to one of the biggest things that we're gonna be talking about in this chapter, which is pivoting. So tidy data, there are a couple of examples of tidy data here that will show you just what tidy data looks like. So here you are, we have a couple of examples of tables here that you can look at that are examples of tidy data. So you have table one, table two, and then table three. And you can see here how they all follow roughly the same format in regards to just how it's structured and how all the rows are arranged and what columns and rows and observations represent. So you can, you can try this out yourself you know, in our studio. So generally when it comes to tidy data, um, what tidy data is, is that for any table that you work with, it follows these three basic rules that are important in, in regards to just working with tidy data. So these rules are number one, every variable is a column. Each column is a variable. And you can kind of see it here where say in this table three here, this first column is country, which is a variable that has the names of all these different countries. So you can see here that this column is a variable. So that's the first rule. And then the second rule is that each observation is a row, each row is an observation meaning that every single row here represents one observation. So if I'm working at a data set, like say I have a list of countries and data for each country, so every row would represent data for one particular country. And number three, each value is a cell, each cell is a single value. And this basically means that every single cell in, in your data frame or data table or whichever structure you use to store your data, each cell in this structure is supposed to represent a value for that particular column as it belongs to this row. So for example, let's say in table three, or especially table two, you have this cell here, um, 19, 1999, which represents the year, which is data, in this column year that belongs to this particular column for Afghanistan as it relates to type cases and then the count 745. And so here are just some visual ways that you can sort of memorize and understand how tidy data should look. Variables, 
observations as you go from left to right for each row. And then all the individual values are the, corresponding to that row and the column. And now you might be wondering, how come we don't store tidy data in other formats? Or why do we have these specific rules? Well, while there really isn't that much of a restrictions on what kind of rules you can have on how to store your data, it's important that when it comes to working with data that you have a sense of rules and structure for how you organize your data. And it's important to have a consistent format for it for a couple of reasons. One of it makes it just much easier in terms of reading it, as if everyone just has a different system for storing data, it makes it really hard to work with data when not everyone is using the same format. And number two, it works best with our tendency to work with vectors. As almost everything we've done so far in the tidyverse and just anything in R in general is all vector heavy and vectors. And so since all these tidyverse packages are built on tidy data, it's important that we organize and make sure our data is tidy. So that way, if we want to use these packages to look at our data, um, you should make sure that the data is tidy so that way it's able to read it and work with it. All right. And so just to um, give a couple of demonstrations, let's uh, run a couple of code just to really explore um, you know, tidy data and see how in action, how all these tidyverse packages and tools all do it, do it through the tidy data framework. So if I were to run this code, so if I go back and decide to run, say, table one, hold on a second. So right here, you can see here that no matter what function I, I put, put it through, whether it's mutate or filter, all these different functions we've learned, it still returns a, a data frame or a tibble in this case, that follows the tidy format. Each row corresponds to one particular set in this data set. Each column is a variable, and each value is corresponds to the column that it's for and the particular row that it's in. So that's an example of ways in which everything you do follows this tidy data format. And even when you do macro functions where you're doing a lot of wrangling with the data and generating different tables with it, it still follows that tidy data format. So if I were to get um, a summary of total cases for each year, especially for you know this country data set, you can see here, even when I'm creating new tables with these tidyverse tools like summarize or group by, it still returns a, 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 a table that, or a tibble, that follows the, the tidy format. You know, you have your columns in your rows and your observation ob and these values for correspond to the column and the row. So you can see here through these examples that everything you do all follows the tidy data format with columns as variables, rows as observations, and each of these cells representing values for that column and that row. So there you have. And, and you can even you can even just run this data set and just do some plotting just to kind of see this 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 tidy data plotted just to kind of show you about it. So that's just one good example of it. And as a quick sort of refresher of some of the things we've learned in regards to plotting. And so we can see here that tidy data framework is a pretty powerful tool. And just for not only just organizing your data set, but also being able to do so much with it and also have a consistent format that you can follow that way for better readability and efficiency. And while you can see how powerful the tidy data framework is, it's important to know that in the real world, most real data isn't always tidy, usually for a couple of reasons. You know, maybe there's a lack of time or knowledge of tidy data in order to truly implement these things or even clean these data sets. As you can see here, all these tables that we've looked at, 
they're all been cleaned for you. So this is why they look very neat and very organized. And they definitely fit in the tidy data framework because it's already been cleaned for you. Which is, so, so any data set you might find in, in a real world situation is probably going to be clean, which brings the question of how do you make that data set tidy? How do you make it clean like these tables here? And one of the ways you can go about it is through pivoting. So one of the ways to tidy data is to pivot data into a form that's tidy, where variables are columns, observations are rows, and each value represents data for that particular column and row. And there are two functions that you can use in order to pivot, which is pivot longer and pivot wider. And we're going to start off by focusing on pivot longer first. So a good example to show how pivot longer works is by looking at a data set. So here we have a data set called billboard where you can see here, especially in this table right here, that it's essentially a data set that tracks all the rankings for each song for each week in the year 2000. So you have these songs and then you look at their billboard rankings per for each week in the year 2000. And you can see here how the data set looks a bit messy because one of the problems is that you have all this data for weeks from one to say 52. But the problem is not all songs are in the top 100 billboard chart for all 52 weeks. Some songs stay there and then they drop, which means that you might have some columns where you get blank information like this, for example, like this um, artist here. If you look at row two, you see here that there's rankings for this song and then it drops to NA because now the song fell out of the top 100, which means that you might get some columns that may not be useful for, the, for each particular observation. And one of the ways we can address this is by using pivot longer to take data in the column names into a new column and then take the data in each of the pivoted columns to another new column. So instead of having it where we just, where we just have week one all the way to week 52, we can create a column that holds all this information about the week and then store that separately instead of having it where we're just lining up all the columns. So the way it works is with pivot longer, the column names week one, week two become values in the new column that we're going to call week. And the values that are in here for week one, week two, they now go to a new column called rank. So, so, so here we go. So with that in mind, here's how we're going to do it in pivot longer. So when you're trying to use pivot longer on a data set, the first thing you do is you have your data set and then you use your, your pipe operator and then use pivot longer. And you have these three arguments here. So you have calls, which represents which columns that you want to pivot or at least wrangle. So in this case, we want to modify the columns that st start with week. So week one, all the way to week 52. So we're here, we're just modifying all the columns that start with with week. And then this names to argument basically allows you to specify which column do you want to put the column names to? So where do you want all these column names to go? What column will store all these column names here? The ones that you specified in this argument right here. All right. So in this case, we're going to put all these column names like week one all the way to week 52 in a new column called week. And then values to basically is a way to, to specify the values of these columns that we're going to pivot. Where do you want them to go? Which new column do you want it to go? So in this case, we're going to put each value for each of these weeks, like week one, week two, week three, and so on, into a new column called rank. And so if you run this command right here, you'll get this result where you can see here how different it is from the previous table, where now all this week one, week two, week three, it's now saved to a new column called week. 
where instead of having to having a bunch of redu- um, columns from week one to week 52, where we also get NAs as well, we now have it where, where for each row, it represents the song and we get different data for the billboard ranking for that particular week. That way we don't have it where, say for one song, let's say that song has only been on for about five weeks. You don't get a bunch of redundant data after week five, where it's just a, a lot of NAs or empty value rows, empty um, values here. And then also for rank, you can also see here all those rank data, which came from here that corresponds to this artist and this track date. It's now been put into a new column called rank. So you can see here for, let's say for example, this song, Baby Don't Cry by Tupac, we now have different data for where for each row represents each week that that song has been in the top 100. And then corresponding with a different value for that billboard ranking. And now you may have noticed in, um, as earlier that we do have missing values for some rows as the part of it has to do with the data format, wanting to have data for multiple weeks. As you can kind of see here that we have columns for week one all the way to week 52, which means that you're gonna have songs where even if they don't um, stay in the top 100 billboard for a, for at least like 52 weeks, there's still data for it, but we don't want that. And so there's a way you can get rid of these NAs. Especially since like, say for the example, this song, Baby Don't Cry, it's only been in the top 100 billboards for up to seven weeks and then it dropped from it. So we don't need this information right here. This, all this NAs right here. Cause you can just assume from the fact that the data just goes up to week seven that it wasn't in the top 100 after week seven. So a way to get rid of that is by adding the argument values drop NA true to remove the NAs in the data set. And this is something we'll talk about in chapter 19 in regards to how to get rid of these missing values or how to address them. But the way it works is, so you go back to your, your argument, you go back to this previous command that we ran and you want to type in, especially after this, you want to type in values underscore drop NA, which basically tells Pivot Longer to drop any NAs that it finds when it's trying to make a new column to store all these values right here. And so if you run it, you notice, especially here, that now we don't see any redundant data for week eight all the way to week 52 for this song right here. And you can see here, it just goes to the next song. As we can already tell from here that the fact that we only have data up to week seven, that it didn't last very long in the top 100 billboards. So, so there's no need to have week eight, week nine, and just have NAs. So, does that make sense? Yeah. I know that pivoting is kind of a new concept, but as we move forward, you'll kind of get the hang of it as I show more complicated examples of pivoting, for sure. And so you can see here, this is just one way to pivot longer, where you have column names that, column names, and you want to really make it, treat that as values and put it in one column. And now to take it a step further from what this pivoting example that I showed you, you can also go a little bit further by taking the week numbers from the value of week, like you can see these week numbers, and then just simply take the numbers instead, rather than just printing out week one, week two, week three. And this is useful if you're just trying to um, do some calculations with it or something like that. So, so you can, to make it easier to read, one of the ways you can go about it is by just using the, so you do the same thing as you did before. So you still have this values drop NA here. However, you add this extra part here 
where you mutate it, meaning you modify an existing column or you add a new column, or in this case, you're modifying the existing column to simply get the number. So what this parse number function does is that it takes a string or a column that contains it, that is made up of strings, and it takes out the numbers that are found in that string. So in this case, this um, column name week one, it basically looks for any numbers that I can find and it takes that number and it returns that number. So in this case, if we have for this name week one, we have this number one, it pulls it out and just gets rid of the rest. So if you run this command here, so if I just run it in here, You can see here that instead of just week one, week two, week three, we just only have the week numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, as it corresponds to this song and how long it's been in the top 100. So it isn't really necessary, but it is nice if you want to make it more readable and you don't need, or you, and you don't want that week one, that week, that string week WK in front of that. And this right here is just a visualization of how this, the rank of songs change over time. So, here, so that you can run here. Isn't necessary, but it's. Oh, okay. Does parse numbers work on text with running zeros like week zero one and week zero two? It should work. Actually, you can try that, so for sure. So let's start out by typing out a string. So read r parse number. Let's try it with a string. So let's try week 01. Yeah, it works. It returns one. So yes, um, to answer your question, um, Jeremy, yes, it does work when you have running zeros. It's just that when you it, when you run this command, it will just ignore that those running zeros. Yeah, but so does that answer your question? All right. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So it it'll work. It was just ignore the leading zeros, but if you just want the number, then it should be it it works. All right. So now that we talked a lot about pivoting, um I think it helps to explain how pivoting works. So that way you have an understanding of how it works, how it functions and what it's doing to it. So let's say, for example, you have this data frame right here or this, this table, and you want to pivot these column names to, to get this. So what it's doing is that, so this is the original table and this table on the right is the table that you end up getting when you pivot. So what happens with, with this pivoting is that what it works is that how it works is that it takes these column names right here and it makes them become values in a new column. And so you see here, and then what it does with the values for these two columns that are being pivoted, as you see highlighted in green and blue, is that it takes these values and it puts it in another column. So while these column names go into one column, the values that go that went with these original columns now go to a new column. So you can see here BP1 for let's say ID A, BP1, BB2 go into a new column that we're going to call measurement. And then you might wonder what happens to this 100 that goes with BP1 for A? Well, with pivoting, and this is something you specify with the call the argument value two, like this one right here. What happens is that it now goes to a a new column called, you can call value, and it corresponds to this BP1. So that's kind of how pivoting works. You take the column names into a new column, and then you take the values that went with those original columns into a new column. And now you might notice that the ID A is repeated twice. And the reason for that is that it's repeated twice to correspond with the va values for that correspond with the original pivoted columns. So for example, here, you see here how A 
this row A has the value 100 for BP1 and value 120 for BP2. The reason why you see two A's is basically just to say, hey, this value of 100 goes with BP1 for ID A, and this value for 120 goes with BP2 of A. Basically, just to make sure that, identify that where these values belong to specifically. So that's why it's being repeated twice, because there's two columns that, that A has data for, and in this being repeated twice is just to make basically tell the table that, hey, these values belong to A. Yeah. Because you see here, A has BP1, BP2. So this is just a way to, to remind you of that. All right. So, so far, we've kind of seen some general examples of pivoting. And then there's this question of, what happens when you have a lot of variables in the column names? Because in the previous example, we just take the whole column name and we just put it in a column. But what if that column name has information for multiple variables? Mm -hmm. Where instead of just taking this column name and putting a value, what if you want to take a lot of information in it and put each information in that column name into a separate, into different, into a bunch of new columns? So as a demonstration, let's look at the WHO data on tuberculosis diagnosis under the name WHO2. So if you run that, you can see here that we do have um, some data here, right here, where you have SP and then you have M and then 14, for example, here. This is a case where you have multiple pieces of information in this column where you don't want that whole column name to then be, become values in one column. You want to take pieces of this column name and put it in separate columns. So it's not just the whole column name go to one column. You want to take pieces of it and put it in different columns. So in this case, you want SP to go to one column, M to go one column, and this 14 to go another column. So essentially, you're taking this column name and you're having these three parts of it become values in three different columns. So one of the ways that you can go about it is by, so you just do the same thing as you did before, except this names to argument, which allows you to specify where the column names go to. And this names to argument, you specify a vector of column names. So instead of just putting one column name as we did before, you can specify the names of these different columns that you want the values to go to. And you wanna make sure that the order matters too because whatever order you put columns where you want to go is also the order in which it'll take each part of the column name and put it into these three columns. So in this example, um, SP basically is a code name for the diagnosis method. And then M is essentially the gender for, in which you, have, you got this data for. And then this 14 is just this age range data for this age range that's being looked at. So you have you, these, because of the order of these different pieces of the column names, you wanna make sure that when you write down your names too, that the order of these new column names is matches up with the order, because this is the order that it's gonna to use to put each of these parts from left to right into these new columns, right? So this is the one thing that changes. And then you also have this, name sep extra argument called name set which allows you to specify what's the character that's separating all these different pieces of information so in this case it's an underscore because you can see here sp m and then this number 14 they're all separated by an underscore so that argument name separator allows you to specify what's separating the names that way it knows oh this is sp this is m and 14 and this is what's separating it. So I know wh which values to take and what to put in the new columns. Oh, uh, good question. So this, this um, exclamation mark columns, basically, so what, what the, this is doing is that, so what it's basically saying is that, what, that the columns that we're pivoting should not be either country to year. 
So, so country to year is sort of like um, like a range of values. So, so country and then that colon is saying ignore columns that are from country to year. So ignore these two columns. So you have these two columns, and then this this exclamation mark basically negates that. It says ignore all columns that are from country to year. So so essentially what it's saying is that ignore these two columns. It's doing because if I didn't put that exclamation mark, it's gonna it's gonna pivot on these two columns. So that ampersand essentially negates that. So instead of including these columns, it now tells them don't include those two columns. Do include everything else. If that makes sense. Yeah. So this exclamation mark, and this is something we'll get into later in the book. This exclamation mark is just a way to take a statement and then do the opposite, like negate it. So instead of including country to year, it's not going to include those two. It will include everything else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it that exclamation mark means in this case. And so once you run this command here, um, you now can see here that the output that you get are these three new columns that we created using this pivot longer function. So you have SP, M, and 14, which we all got from the column names here being pivot. So it's a very similar example to what we did, but it's a lot more complex in that we're taking different pieces of the column names and putting it into different columns. So that's one way to, to do it, especially when it comes to, we want to pivot a column into two new columns. Sure. Now, now that's just one specific case of where it could be complicated for pivoting longer. But then there's also another case that you might be dealing with, which is what if the data and the variable names are both column headers? Meaning what if the, the data and the variable names for the are both embedded in the column name? So here's a good example. Let's look at the household data set, for example. So here in this household data set, you can see here we have this, for, you have um, data for family, for different families, where we have, you can see here in this column name DOB child one, we have a variable name DOB, which represents the date of birth of, for that child. And they also have child one, this identifier that indicates which child it is in, in this family. So you can see here, this is an example of a situation where we have a column header where it has data and also a, um, a variable name. So in this case, the variable name is DOB, which represents date of birth. And then this data is child one, essentially indicating which child is this data for. And you can see this for the other columns too. Date of birth, child two, name child one, name child two. And we want to pivot longer so that way we can take all this data and put it in different columns. So just like before, we're gonna do roughly the same thing that we did before where we take a split a column header into a bunch of columns, but we're gonna modify it a little bit to be specific to this case. So, so here you, you, you run the same command again, pivot longer, where you kind of do the same thing as before. And then you have this family column and this basically this exclamation mark, basically saying, do not include the column family. So, so that's what this means. So we're going to pivot on all these other columns, but we're not going to ignore the column family. And then here is where it gets a little bit different. So names two, where do you want the column names to go to? You have this, um, this argument dot value and then child. So essentially what this dot value is, it's a special argument you can pass that basically tells um, the tells um, pivot longer function where to get the column values from to pass to the argument values to automatically. 
So in this case, if you go back to date of birth, DOB child one, this dot value argument right here, essentially telling pivot longer to use DOB in the name DOB child one as the name of a new column to hold data right here. So this dot value essentially is saying, um, take the value that <clears throat> that for the, va the value that's stored in DOB child one, take the name of it from here for this. And then child one, take um, that and put it as data for a new, new column called child. Then child one becomes part of a column called child. So if you go, if you run this command, you'll get this table where each row corresponds to a child to this particular family. So for family one, we have all this data for child one here, the name and the date of birth. And then here we have all the data for child two in family one and all the date of birth and the name. So in, in case this is confusing, here's kind of a demonstration about what's going on with this example. So you have this table right here and you wanna take where you have these columns, ID, X1, X2, Y1, Y2. And you wanna pivot to so get this table. So what happens is that you go back here so you have the columns you want to pivot, and then you have this names too, this dot value. Essentially, what it does is that you're taking the values of each of these, and then you're putting it in a new column. And then you take all these values here that go with each of them, and then you store it in another column. So you have your X and your Y here. And then you take this extra argument, you put it in another column. So that's kind of how it works in regards to pivoting in this specific case, right? Is that everyone got it? Make sense? I know that's a lot, but feel free to practice with this as pivoting it something that takes a while to kind of wrap your head around. Okay. So, so far we talked a lot about pivoting longer where in the examples that you saw, what we usually do is we take columns and we just essentially make it longer, like make tables longer. So we're essentially kind of adding more rows. But what if we're in a situation where we wanna do the opposite of that, where instead of adding more rows and cutting down on the number of columns, what if we want to widen the data set? where we want more columns and less rows. So in that situation, we have a, a handy function called pivot wider, where you can add more columns and have less rows. And a good way to demonstrate that is through this example. So let's say you have this table here called CMS patient experience. We have data on patient experiences in the centers for Medicaid and Medicare services. Where you can see here, there's a bit of a problem here with this data set. So one of the problems here is that you can see here that you have the name of the organization, but the problem is you have all these different metrics for this organization where we have, where the data for this organization is spanning multiple columns, where for each row, it represents one metric that's being recorded for this, for this organization. But what if I want, what if I want it where, where for each row, it represents one organization and I have all the data that I want for that organization all on that single row, instead of having it cross over multiple rows like here. Because right now it's just going across multiple rows. And what if you want it where all this data here is all on one row instead of just cutting across multiple rows. And so essentially what we want is where each row contains data for one medical service provider. 
instead of having separate rows. And we can do that with the pivot wider function. So the way it works with um, the function pivot wider is that you first, so you have this argument called ID calls where you can specify which columns has the data that you want to use to uniquely identify each row. So instead of the, the values from the, the, instead of what we did with pivot longer, we now want to identify the column that has the names of the columns that we want to pull from. Or the names, or essentially like the column that has a way for us to uniquely identify each row. So in this case, we pick the columns that start with org because these two columns here basically specify the name of the organization and the ID number for each organization. Because we want it where each row represents one organization with one unique ID, right? And then next up, we have the, the argument names from where we pick up the column, we find, the, we specify the column where the column names for the new columns will come from. So in this case, we specify measure CD, which indicates all the, the names of these different metrics right here. So that's where we're going to pull all the column names from, from this column here. And you, you can see here, if you were to pull it up in R, where if, if you were to look into it, you can see here that Let me see, right, oh wait, wait, let me go back here for a second. So you can see here that all these, these names in measure CD are all names of the different metrics. So group one is especially describing what kind of number is this is. And then group two is specifying that number and so on and so forth. So these are all names for these different numbers. As every organization, they all have these same set of column names, and we want it to use that as the column names. So you use this names from argument to specify where the column names for the new columns are going to be from. And then you use the argument values from right here to specify the column that has the values for each of these new columns that would be labeled using the names from the argument names from. So you see all these numbers. You, that's where you pass into names from, where you essentially tell pivot wider, pivot wider what numbers correspond to each of these new column names. So in this case, you want this group one here to be its own column with this number. So that's what's kind of what's happening here. And so if you run this command, you can see here that each row represents one different organization. You see how there's different names for each room. And then for each of these columns, we have separate data that goes with this row. So instead of having to look at multiple columns, or multiple rows, uh, sorry, multiple rows to get data for this particular organization. I, I now have it where each row, I have all the data that I need for that particular organization. So this is what we mean by pivot wider, where we take a data set and we make it wider by adding more columns here. So... So anyway, so that is it for chapter six of data tidying. Um, I know that's kind of a lot, especially this concept of pivoting, but um, feel free to try this code out as there's a lot to pivoting that you know, is worth looking into. And, and definitely um, check out the diagrams if you want to look back on you know, how pivoting works. And so I want to say um, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, it's... I'm glad you all came to see this book club for chapter six and I hope you all um, come to the next one that's happening next week for chapter seven. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. All right. Have a great rest of your day.
Thank you.